Hi everyone, this is Dr. A. We're going to go over blood gases in acid-base balance. It's chapter 13 of Clinical Chemistry 1 uh, based on Larson's textbook. And we're just going to start with a case. So Jeremy is a 48-year-old man who was admitted to the hospital complaining of abdominal pain. He appeared apprehensive. Other complaints were abdominal bloating and back pain. He was short of breath. Um, blood gas results show the following. So his pH is 7.58, so that's high. The PCO2 is 22, which is low, and the PO2 is 77, which is also low. And um, how would you interpret those blood gas results? So we're just going to look at a few parameters here. Um, so first, the pH being high means he's too alkaline, and so it'll be an alkalosis. And the CO2 and O2 being low means he has having some, maybe some respiratory issues. Um, it looks like he could be hyperventilating, potentially having some kind of panic attack, which is quite common, um, a common reason for a, a low CO2 and a high pH. But there's some other things that could be going on because of his uh, abdominal issues. Um, and so he could have also excess, uh, taking too many antacids, or something like that. Antacids are, um, you know, a base are very alkaline, and so that can alkalinize the blood. So there's many things that we would need more information to to find out. But there's many things that can be happening with this patient. So again, just to see if you were paying attention, uh, does Jeremy have acidosis or alkalosis? All right, so let's talk about blood gases as a test. So blood gas analysis requires first a sample that's obtained by arterial puncture. Uh, usually the sites of collection are gonna be radial or brachial artery. And it is used to evaluate the pH, the oxygen content and the carbon, carbon dioxide content of blood, but obviously specifically of arterial blood. This allows you to evaluate how the lungs are oxygenating the blood and removing the carbon dioxide. You can use capillary specimens on infants. Uh, they're called cap gases or capillary gases. They have uh, both, of course, require special collection procedures. They're not uh, the same as a venipuncture. In most institutions, though, the respiratory department is responsible for both the collection and the analysis of blood gases. But uh, some clinical laboratories still do perform the analysis of blood gases, and some will still actually collect blood gases. So it's a good it's a good thing to know anyway. Uh, partial pressure is the amount of pressure that's contributed uh, by gas to the total pressure. And when we measure the oxygen content, carbon dioxide content of blood, one of the measurements that we'll take is the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Um, the units of measure of that partial pressures are going to be millimeters of mercury. Blood gases uh, also measure the percent saturation of blood, and uh, it's actually percent this percentage of hemoglobin molecules whose binding sites are filled by oxygen. This is where you often see it would be um, like a 98% or 99%, of course, or lower if there's having some issues. Uh, so it's always a, a percentage value. Another concept that we need to talk about is the concept of respiration. So respiration involves the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, so diffusing across membranes. Um, when it happens at the lungs, so this is air going, or the gas is oxygen going from the alveoli of the lungs into the capillaries uh, that are there around the lungs, that is called external respiration. So it's that crossing over of that oxygen from the air um, into the blood or in and the carbon dioxide from the blood going into the oxygen of the air and then being able to leave the body. Internal respiration is again the same um, two gases that are exchanged but it's the delivery of the oxygen from the capillary blood to the cells so oxygen crosses over uh, in that direction and then the cells are producing a lot of CO2 as they are using that oxygen to make ATP and so the CO2 or carbon dioxide then is leaving the cells and entering capillary circulation. Dalton's law says that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the partial pressures that make up the mixture. And 
For blood gases, as we mentioned, oxygen and carbon dioxide are the two gases in the mixture that we are concerned with. Henry's law says the amount of gas dissolved in a solution is directly proportional to the pr partial pressure of the gas so that we can measure the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of CO2, and that would be equivalent to uh, the amount of that gas that is dissolved in the blood. So a little bit more about breathing processes and partial pressures. So air, as you breathe it in, so, so air from the room, if you will, has a partial pressure of oxygen of 158 millimeters of mercury and a partial pressure of CO2 of 0 0.3 millimeters of mercury. So there's hardly any CO2 in the air that you breathe, but there's a lot of oxygen. Once uh, that air, you have inhaled it, it has gone down your trachea, your bronchi, and has reached the alveoli, the end of your uh, bronchi, bronchioles, uh, where gas exchange happens. Then the PO2 starts to drop to 104 millimeters of mercury as it's crossing over and going into the blood. And the PCO2 climbs to 40 millimeters of mercury as it's being offloaded from the capillary blood into the alveoli so you can breathe it out. External respiration, which is, again, the crossing of the gases at the alveoli uh, membrane, in that process, the PO2 is about 80 to 100 milligrams of mercury. So that's how much you can expect to, to for it to cross over and end up in the capillary circulation there around the lungs and then eventually then be, being what's in arterial blood that's being pumped from the heart. And in external respiration, we already mentioned the PCO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury. And so that's how much is coming from the capillary blood and crossing over uh, into the alveoli and being breathed out. In, uh, internal respiration, so what happens between external respiration and internal respiration is the heart pumps and circulates the blood and the blood goes you know, from the lungs to the heart, from the heart to the rest of the body and the tissues. And um, once it reaches the tissue, that's, and, and it starts, cro the oxygen starts crossing over from the capillaries into the tissues, then the, the pr partial pressure of oxygen will drop all the way down to about 45 millimeters of mercury, which is in what it would, you would expect it reasonably to be in venous blood. Okay, so it offloads, it doesn't offload it all the way down to zero, it offloads it down to 45. So it goes from 80 millimeters of mercury or, or 80, you know, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury down to 45. And that's how much is delivered into the tissues. And the partial pressure of CO2 is a little bit higher, is 50 millimeters of mercury at the tissue. And then some of that will be offloaded um, at the alveoli, but some of it will be left behind. So your partial pressure of CO2 in arterial blood is never going to be zero also. Uh, there's always some of it that's still left in the mix. Your chemoreceptors are chemical receptors in your body, and they monitor your partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, and they're located in various parts of the body. Some of them are around the brain. Some of them are in the arteries, uh, especially close to the heart. Changes uh, in these, the chemoreceptors, so they detect these changes of the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide, then alert the brain to increase or decrease the rate of breathing so that you can get, you know, either more oxygen or blow off excess carbon dioxide. Okay, so this graph represents what we just talked about. So uh, again, here, inhale and exhale, so this would be external respiration uh, and it's not showing um, what is going on in internal respiration so it's just showing on uh, external respiration at the alveoli so uh, air that's inhaled again 159 for the o2 co2 is only 0.3 very low oxygen but by the time it reaches the alveoli it's 100 of O2 and 40 of CO2. And so therefore, um, the pressures are going to be equal on both sides. So because uh, this drops from 59 to 100, it's basically because 59 of it is crossing over and loading, it's going to load until the pressures are equal on both sides of the membrane. And that's because oxygen moves by diffusion, and it diffuses until it's equal on both sides of the membrane. And since um, 
Venus blood is coming in um, with a CO2 of 46. Some of it will be offloaded. Arterial blood usually has a CO2 of 40. That means your partial pressure of uh, CO2 and alveoli is never going to be um, lower than 40. It's going to always going to match uh, the 40 of the arterial blood. Uh, so anyway, so that's, and then you breathe out. Uh, the CO2 uh, is 28 and uh, PO2 in the air that you breathe out is 27. And in case you're wondering what the noise is, if you hear it, those are my cats that are playing with something they found and making a racket. Okay, so your poll question is, where is PO2 the highest, in the lungs or in the tissues? So where's the partial pressure of CO2 the highest? All right, so let's dive into oxygen, its clinical significance in the body. So we need oxygen because we need to make ATP. And the most efficient way to make ATP is to use oxygen. And it goes through the Krebs cycle in uh, oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain. And that is where most of the ATP is made. Um, your blood gas measurements will assess and monitor both your res respiratory and metabolic conditions so that um, we're going to talk about that. But respiratory conditions are things that are going on with the lungs and that are usually, um, you know, all altering the gas exchange. So a respiratory condition could be COPD, a respiratory condition could be um, lung cancer, it could be pneumonia. Um, there's, there's, a lot of various conditions here, but then metabolic conditions uh, can also affect um, the pH and the gases, and um, they would be things like sepsis, diabetic ketoacidosis, and um, other you know severe conditions. Uh, but they're metabolic in origin, meaning the problem is not really in the lungs; the problem is somewhere else in the body. So oxygen is transported in the blood by hemoglobin. So each hemoglobin molecule can transport four molecules of oxygen, and you have trillions of these molecules uh, in your blood uh, that are obviously contained in red cells. And the oxygen saturation, as we mentioned al already, is a ratio of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin compared with the total amount of hemoglobin that is capable of binding oxygen. Um, we rarely walk around with completely 100% saturation of our red cells. Um, it's quite normal to be, you know, 96, 97, 98% saturation. It is usually measured by a co-oximeter, um, which it measures the absorption at different wavelengths in order to distinguish the difference between oxyhemoglobin and other types of hemoglobin, which would be deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, self-hemoglobin, and all that. And then it can calculate the percentage saturation. All right, oxygen saturation, hemoglobins that can affect oxygen saturation will include carboxyhemoglobin, that's hemoglobin that is bound to carbon monoxide, uh, so that would be seen in like fires and smoke inhalation, also seen in people that smoke, uh, smokers, because they get chronic exposure to carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, methemoglobin and self-hemoglobin and cyan methemoglobin, and these are all abnormal forms of hemoglobin um, that can happen. Some, some, sometimes it's a, there's a genetic component, but um, exposures to certain drugs can cause these to form. Uh, but all of these hemoglobins, the important thing to remember is they do not allow oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. So these, these types of hemoglobin can't transport oxygen, and that's uh, a concern because uh, we need oxygen to be transported into blood, and it has to be transported on hemoglobin. So an oxygen saturation less than 95% then is indicative of, of a decreased ability to transport oxygen on your hemoglobin. Other factors that can affect the oxygen transport include the partial pressure of O2 and the diffusion of oxygen across the alveolar membrane. So as we saw in the graph earlier, that oxygen was trying to cross from the alveoli of the lungs into the capillary. If that membrane is damaged, it can 
interfere with this oxygen crossing over. Um, and that would cause, you know, the damage of the uh, alveoli is often to its uh, emphysema is a condition that damages the, those. Pulmonary edema would be um, swelling and fluid accumulation around the lungs. That would also interfere with uh, the diffusion of the oxygen. So you could have plenty of hemoglobin to carry the oxygen, but the oxygen can't cross over from the lungs into the blood, and then that could cause low PO2 readings. A little bit on hypoxia versus cyanosis. So this is, again, just in hypoxemia, uh, just some minor differences. So hypoxia is low oxygen, hypo, low oxia, oxygen. So condition of low oxygen. So it's caused by a lack of oxygen. Uh, cyanosis usually refers to decreased oxygen due to a non-functional hemoglobin. So, uh, so the oxygen can't bind on hemoglobin and you get cyanosis. Um, a lot of times cyanosis is referred to because cyan uh, is a blue color in osis, so a condition of being blue. Um, signs of cyanosis usually involve like uh, bluing or graying fingertips, bluing or graying lips, or um, other, you know, little uh, spaces, sometimes a little bit the nose or the ears, um, but it's often seen in the lips and fingertips. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a classic example of a non-functional hemoglobin that causes cyanosis. Um, it uses all of the available oxygen binding slots to bind car uh, carbon monoxide. And the bond between carbon monoxide and hemoglobin is 200 times stronger than that between hemoglobin and oxygen. And so what happens is it just, once it's bound on there, it won't let go. And the only way the body can deal with it is has to destroy that red cell, destroy that hemoglobin, recycle it, and make some fresh uh, hemoglobin. Hypoxemia just means low oxygen in the blood. So uh, hypoxemia is a state of decreased arterial oxygen, and it's often caused by problems in the lungs, such as pulmonary edema or obstructive airways or anything that would interfere from the oxygen actually getting to uh, cross over into that, um, the capillary, the arterial capillaries. So um, do you know, uh, how does hemoglobin carry carbon um, dioxide or CO2, right? Is it bound on iron like oxygen? Is it bound to the protein portion of heme or it just doesn't carry CO2? So this is a question for you. And we're gonna look at carbon dioxide in its transport. So carbon dioxide is transported in three different forms. It is transported primarily as bicarbonate or um, HCO3. And it is also transported as carbaminoglobin. So this is uh, carbon dioxide that's bound to hemoglobin, but it does not bind on the same on the iron it doesn't it binds on the protein portion of hemoglobin so it does not replace oxygen uh, and then a little bit of it is transported simply dissolved as carbon dioxide in the plasma the uh, you do you do need to know this Henderson Hasselbalch equation or at least be able to recognize it uh, and it relates to carbon dioxide pH and pCO2 Car carbon dioxide, as in total carbon dioxide, which we're gonna s we're gonna see, and we've talked about before, that is actually equivalent, pretty close to the bicarb content of the blood, and um, so the pH is the pK plus the log of the base of the acid, and in this equation, the the total carbon dioxide uh, expressed as the bicarbonate is your base, and your pCO two is your acid. So here's, uh, this illustrates how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. So in the tissues, carbon dioxide, a little bit of it is dissolved as CO2. A little bit more of it can just bind on hemoglobin, but again, on the protein portion of hemoglobin, not on the iron portion of hemoglobin. And then, uh, th but most of it is going to cross over into the red cell is going to pick up water from the red cell and with carbon 
carbonic anhydrase is going to become carbonic acid and carbonic acid is going to uh, split into bicarb and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are going to be picked up by the protein portion of hemoglobin and the bicarb is going to be kicked out into at the tissue level here into the plasma in exchange for chloride and chloride is going to move in. Okay. And uh, hemoglobin also is delivering oxygen there at the tissues. So oxygen is leaving hemoglobin. All right, so then this red cell uh, in the car in this uh, bicarb in the chloride, um, chloride's in here, but you know all of that travels all the way to the lungs, and we arrive at the lungs. So um, at the lungs, obviously the lungs can pick up oxygen; it can bind to hemoglobin. The hemoglobin that was carrying the CO two on this, the protein portion then um, can let go of the CO two. And uh, the CO2 is going to cross over and um, leave. The dissolved CO2 obviously is also just going to leave. And then um, the reverse reaction is going to happen. So um, bicarb is going to then come back into the red cell and chloride is going to leave. So they switch places again. And uh, it's going to go pick up that hydrogen ion that it had uh, stuck on a hemoglobin molecule, on the protein portion of a hemoglobin molecule. Uh, and together uh, with the help of carbonic anhydrase, it's going to make carbonic acid. Um, and then that is going to disassociate into water and CO2, which will, of course, diffuse out of the red cell and then diffuse out into the lungs. So uh, a little bit on the clinical significance of carbon dioxide. So hypercapnia is uh, increased PCO2 levels. So it's CO2 retention or um, too much CO2 being produced in the blood. It is caused by breathing in too much carbon dioxide, like in cities with smog and lots of pollution, car pollution, or by what we call decreased alveolar ventilation, meaning the... You don't, you're not ventilating or moving air in and out, so you're not breathing it out. This happens a lot of times uh, when people take overdoses of drugs that depress, that are de de depressants, uh, and they take them like that, so they make them sleepy. There are a lot of times painkillers, and but if you take too much, then it depresses the rate of breathing, uh, and they breathe very, very shallow, and then the CO2 is not able to leave, and so it accumulates in the blood. Uh, and that would um, decrease the amount of carbon dioxide being exhaled and increase the amount that's being retained in the blood. Also, loss of surface area from emphysema or the obstructions from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease from like uh, chronic bronchitis and all uh, those types of things that interfere with gas exchange can make it harder for the CO2 that's in the blood to be able to leave and enter the lungs. Hypocapnia is not enough CO2 and the main cause of that is going to be hyperventilation where your uh, a patient's hyperventilating so they are breathing out too much of their carbon dioxide and then that would lead to decreased levels in the blood. This is likely what was happening in our case uh, although there are some other explanations too for his ABGs. So how are blood gas specimens collected and what should we consider? So arterial blood is the specimen of choice because, because it gives the most accurate picture of what's going on in the lungs and how well the lungs are, be able, to, are able to oxygenate the, the blood and remove the waste gases like carbon dioxide. Um, there are often um, ABG collection kits are prepackaged. Um, there, there is a prepackaged collection kit for capillary draws on infants. Uh, the prepackaged kits for ABG usually have a self-filling syringe, and so this is very important. The, the syringe for an ABG does not have the suction that a regular syringe does, so if you pull back on the plunger, it's not going to pull the blood into the syringe. So this is important to know. Um, it should be self-filling, so you should, the pressure from the artery should fill the syringe. Um, 
it has a little bead of heparin that you have to be careful not to lose when you open that syringe um, and that needs to stay in there because that allows that blood obviously to not clot so that you can run it through the analyzer and there's usually what used to be a small rubber block now it's a little rubber cap um, we used to embed the needle in it we don't do that anymore it does it does come with a collection needle or you can add your own collection needle which usually has a safety device which once you've collected your blood gas you activate your safety device and you take the needle off and you put the rubber cap on um, some kits can contain a local anesthetic to decrease the pain uh, but usually uh, I've never hardly seen them used um, proper collection is essential uh, you do not use a tourniquet because tourniquet causes stasis of the blood and it will lower the pH and the PO2 uh, the anticoagulant of, of choice, obviously, as I mentioned, is heparin, a little bead. You got to make sure that it stays in there and that it gets properly mixed with your specimen so your specimen doesn't clot. Um, after, after you collect, any excess air, any air bubbles have to be expelled from the sample immediately. So usually when you remove your needle, you'll look at your sample, make sure if there's any air, you can kind of flick it lightly to the top and then push the blood to where it completely fills the syringe and there's no air bubbles at all anywhere and then you put the the lid back on it um on this on the syringe um so once the collection is complete and you have expelled all the air then you have to mix the sample by rolling it gently so that uh that heparin is mixed in there really well uh, and you don't have little clots all over the specimen and then you really need to ideally place it on ice unless your ABG analyzer is just right there maybe in your patient treatment area or it's not far from where you're at and you can carry it right away and go test it so on ice the sample is stable for an hour at room temperature it's only stable for 30 minutes So um, blood gas analysis, uh, there are some parameters that are directly measured and some parameters that are calculated. So a typical blood gas uh, will measure pH, PO2, and pCO2 directly using electrodes. And then from those measurements, it can calculate the bicarb carbonic acid and total CO2 uh, contents. And um, the electrode for the oxygen is the PO2 electrode or the Clark electrode, um, and it has an oxygen permeable membrane. The PCO2 electrode is a modified pH electrode. Um, the carbon dioxide can diffuse across the membrane, and then there's a sodium bicarb solution uh, within the electrode too. Hydrogen ions are produced as basically for each carbon dioxide that crosses over, a hydrogen ion is produced. That causes a change in pH, which corresponds to the level of carbon dioxide. And then the pH electrode is a pH electrode. So it's a potentiometric electrode like the PCO2. They're both built very similarly. Um, and uh, again, it's the same. Uh, it's kind of like with the ion selective electrode. You have a reference electrode and a sample electrode, and the potential difference between the two electrodes, the two solutions, corresponds to the pH of the sample. Um, a non invasive method to um, check, but you can only check oxygen saturation, is a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter just gives you the percent saturation of hemoglobin. Uh, it can often just be put on the finger of the patient, tied to a monitor, and you can see direct readings. It's very quick. So um, now we're going to dive into acid-base theory. So acid-base balance is the body's physiological response to changes in your hydrogen ion concentrations, which those are constantly being generated and used up and produced, and so there's the body has to have a system in place to deal with it. The accepted reference range for an arterial pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So basically it's around 7.4, uh, but it has very little fluctuation there. Um, you know, anything when you go above or below that, then it is cause for great concern. The pH is defined as a negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. The more hydrogen ions you have, the lower the pH is. So um, acids are able to donate hydrogen ions and uh, bases can donate hydroxide ions and pick up the hydrogen ions too. Um, and so um, 
the more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic something is. Buffers are combinations of weak acids and weak bases in their salts, and they are, their job is to resist changes in pH by neutralizing the excess acids or the excess bases and trying to keep the blood pH at 7.4. There are uh, the body and the blood have a few buffers uh, in place that work to maintain your pH to the normal level. So the most important of the buffer system is the bicarbonate system. So it is controlled both by the lungs and by the kidneys. So the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, as we saw in the red cells, can convert the CO2 and water to carbonic acid, and carbonic acid then can disassociate into bicarb and hydrogen ions. Um, although this system does have a low buffering capacity, then the CO2 could be retained or released by the lungs, and that happens by modifying the rate of breathing. And the bicarb can be increased or decreased um, by the kidney so that the bicarb can either be excreted in urine or it can be reclaimed from urine and put back into the blood. So when you look at this uh, chemical equation here, the, the CO2 and water in is what ha is happening in the lungs. So, because this, this, as you saw with the diagram with the red cells, this equation can go back and forth, okay? So the CO2 and water end of it here, the CO2 can be breathed out or retained by the lungs by modifying the breathing rates. And then uh, the bicarb and hydrogen ions both can be excreted or retained by the kidneys. The phosphate uh, buffer system, uh, its main role is to maintain acid-base balance within the cells. It can also, so it can pick up excess hydrogen ions, but donate hydrogen ions also. And then protein in the blood, so because proteins are epitheric, meaning they have positive and negative charges on them, they can act both as a weak acid and a weak base, and so they can pick up um, some, you know, hydrogen ions, but they can also donate hydrogen ions, and so um, they're really good. And we have quite a bit of protein in the blood, so albumin is a protein, um, the, one of the main proteins in the blood. But hemoglobin is also a protein, and uh, it is also kind of its it's its own buffer system. Although it often is classified under the protein buffer system because hemoglobin is a protein and it's amphitheric, and that's how it can help adjust the pH. Um, and so uh, its main job, though, is to prevent those pH cells within. Uh, the pH changes, sorry, within the red cells as it is uh, transporting carbon dioxide. Okay, the action of breathing air in and out of your lungs, what would you call that? Would you call that ventilation, conduction, or respiration? So um, you may or may not have picked up on that. We talked about a little bit. So moving air in and out of your lungs is ventilation. That is why you put people on a ventilator to help them breathe. What you're, help, what you're helping them do is move air in and out of their lungs. Um, and so the main role of breathing, of ventilation, is to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Slow breaths will lead to increase dissolve carbon dioxide in the blood because you're not getting the CO2 out and therefore that increases the amount of carbonic acid so it makes the blood more acidic and lowers the pH okay so too much carbon dioxide gas in the blood makes carbonic acid lowers the pH hyperventilation leads to a large amount of carbon dioxide being expelled from the lungs and that, in turn, is going to increase the bicarb level in the blood and therefore increase the pH because bicarb is a base. So then that will raise the pH instead of lowering the pH. And then the re renal mechanisms to um, compensate and to help, again, adjust the pH uh, are going to be either to reclaim bicarb from the glomerular filtrate or get rid of it. And um, in the tubular cells, hydrogen ions can be exchanged for sodium ions. So again, you can you can dump them and reclaim some sodium also. Um, so the kidneys have have other you know they the kidneys work by 
adjusting bicarbonate hydrogen ion concentrations. And so both of these are going to kick in depending on what's going on with the patient. Uh, and sometimes it's one or the other um, that's going to kick in. So uh, just know that hyperventilation can raise a pH, slowing the breathing will lower the pH. So let's talk about acid base balance. So there are two independent variables that are being looked at the respiratory mechanism and the renal mechanisms. So do, those are the two compensation mechanisms other than the, the buffers that are present. So the respiratory re moves the CO2, remember, because it can move gas, more gas out or less gas out of uh, the body, you know, via the lungs. So uh, whenever uh, your CO2 concentrations are off, it's usually a respiratory problem. Your renal mechanisms regulate bicarb. They move bicarb. Okay. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Acidosis is a pH that's lower than normal, meaning less than 7.35. So your pH is low. And you can have metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis. Um, respiratory acidosis is going to have a respiratory component, usually with an accumulation of excess carbon dioxide gas. Metabolic is going to have uh, an accumulation of acids that are not respiratory, that are um, too much keto acids, too much lactic acids, um, and that is what's going to drive that pH down. Alkalosis is a pH that is higher than 7.45. Um, it can be also metabolic versus respiratory. So um, a respiratory alkalosis with a high P pH usually means um, if it's respiratory in nature, nature, you've gotten rid of too much of your CO2. If it's metabolic in nature, a lot of times you have an excess of bicarb. We're going to go into all of these here in detail. So again, Metabolic disorders involve the bicarb concentration. Respiratory disorders involve the carbon dioxide concentration. So a little matchy game for you guys that are on Nearpod. All right, so let's start with the first one, metabolic acidosis. This is actually commonly seen in your acutely ill patients because there's a lot of different things that can cause metabolic acidosis. Um, metabolic acidosis, uh, again, the problem is metabolic, meaning the problem is going to be related to the bicarb. And so it's not enough bicarb. That bicarb has been usually used up or lost uh, for some reason or another. And uh, there are two types of acidosis. There's elevated anion gap acidosis and normal anion gap acidosis. So in an elevated anion gap acidosis, the bicarb is going to be consumed um, as a buffer. And because there's excess hydrogen ions are being made, and so it's being used up to buffer these uh, hydrogen ions because it is a buffer. Examples of elevated anion gap acidosis are going to be diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, ingestion of methanol or ethylene glycol, and renal failure uremia. All of these can cause a metabolic acidosis with an elevated anion gap. Normal anion gap acidosis come from the loss of bicarb from the body, either through the kidneys or the GI tract. So either the kidneys aren't doing their job and they're losing too much of the bicarb, or the GI tract with like diarrhea or somewhere you're losing your alkaline secretions. Diar so again, diarrhea is a very common of a normal anion gap acidosis that are metabolic acidosis. Another cause is going to be renal tubular acidosis because bicarb is lost in the urine and is not reabsorbed by the kidneys. So the compensation mechanisms in metabolic acidosis, so how does the body deal with it? Because obviously, so the, a lot of times uh, the, either the kidneys can't keep up or the problem is in the kidneys. Uh, so they have to compensate by respiratory actions because your lungs hopefully are working fine or the lungs of the patients are working fine. In metabolic acidosis, the respiratory action is to hyperventilate. Why would we hyperventilate? Because what we can do is uh, all these excess hydrogen ions that are being uh, picked up by the bicarb 
can be made, made into carbonic acid, which is made into CO2, which can be breathed out and it's accumulating, the CO2 is accumulating. And so that will increase your respiratory rate. So you breathe it out. And so somebody does in metabolic acidosis, the body will compensate by hyperventilating to try to get, there's a way to get rid of the acids. The kidneys will try to compensate uh, by trying to excrete excess hydrogen ions and trying to increase the resorption of bicarb, but ki the kidney action is always a lot slower than the respiratory actions. And again, if your problem is like renal tubular acidosis, this is not going to work because the kidneys aren't functioning ideally. Your common lab findings in a metabolic acidosis is going to be a pH of 7.35, so a low pH, a, a low or sometimes normal CO2, and a low bicarb level because um, it is used up trying to buffer, buffer all these excess acids. So um, metabolic acidosis, everything is low. Everything is moved down. Everything is moving in the same direction. Low pH, low to potentially normal CO2, and low bicarb levels. Okay, so this graph is in the Larson book, and I thought it was really interesting to see what's going on. And so, um, so ideally, what what's going on is um, you have there's several things that can happen. So, uh, with a normal acid base balance disturb, you either have too much hydrogen ion that are produced or you're not able to eliminate those hydrogen ions like you should and therefore the blood pH is going to decrease. So it's going to attempt via renal compensation to uh, either take those extra hydrogen ions, convert them to carbonic acid and breathe them out as CO2 via the lungs and so you'll have some hyperventilation in the lungs going on. And by doing that, it's going to use up these bicarb ions. It's also going to attempt to eliminate excess hydrogen ions through the kidneys if that's possible. And um, also uh, the phosphate buffer system, the hemoglobin buffer system, and the protein buffer system are all going to try to pick up all these excess hydrogen ions. Um, if the normal acid base balance is disturbed via a loss of bicarb or a depletion of the bicarb reserve, then um, and you have a normal generation of metabolic acids, that pH is going to decrease. So you don't have an excess production of, of acids, you just lost your bases. Um, and in that case, uh, in your respiratory uh, compensation, your um, sodium bicarb is going to do donate the bicarb to here to this mechanisms uh, of picking up this excess um, big, you know, it's going to uh, need to donate these which have been lost uh, to pick up the normal amount of hydrogen ions are present to become CO2 and be breathed out. Um, and so these can again help uh, breathe out uh, and compensate through the lungs. All right, and the next one is metabolic alkalosis. So uh, you are not as likely to see it, but it is possible to see. So metabolic alkalosis are caused by a bicarb excess. Remember, it's metabolic, so the problem is in the bicarb, and uh, the pH is too high, so you have too much bicarb because bicarb is your base. So this is usually due to an increased ingestion of bases. So antacids or large infuses of, of bases through IVs with high bicarb contents or numerous blood transfusions. All of these things can increase your bases. Um, or you have a decreased excretion of your bases. So like diuretics can cause this by blocking electrolyte reabsorption and increases the amount of excretion of your hydrogen ions. Um, and high levels of aldosterone and, and, in Cushing, and also in Cushing disease can lead to increased excretion of hydrogen ions and then meaning too much of the bicarb is left behind uh, and it's not balanced. Um, you can also, this can also, this also be caused by a loss of acidic fluids, so prolonged vomiting, so your stomach juices are acidic. If you lose too much of those, you can, it, it can actually cause an uh, metabolic alkalosis. Uh, patients that have cystic fibrosis have an impaired ability to produce hydrogen ions, and then that can easily lead to alkalosis for them too.
So how does the body compensate for metabolic alkalosis? Um, the respiratory system is going to attempt to compensate, and so it's going to depress the rate of breathing to keep the carbon dioxide to provide hydrogen ions and uh, bicarb into the equation. And so um, that, again, the carbon dioxide can be converted to carbon, uh, carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can reduce the pH, which is too high currently. And the kidneys will attempt to excrete more bicarb. The lab findings is everything's going to be high. The pH is too high. It's greater than 7.45. The bicarb is high, and it's usually elevated CO2 levels, or sometimes these are normal. So um, in metabolic conditions, sometimes the CO2 is just at normal levels. So, but the idea here is both of these are going to move in the same direction. They're both elevated. So <clears throat> that is pretty typical of metabolic conditions. So in the metabolic con uh, conditions, um, in the acidosis, everything is low. In the alkalosis, everything is high. All right, so um, with a normal acid-base balance, and then uh, if you can have either a loss of hydrogen ions which causes the blood pH to increase. And so you're going to do respiratory compensation by decreasing uh, the respiratory rate to elevate the CO2, which then, so the lungs are putting CO2 kind of back into the system. So it, by making carbonic acid, which provides those hydrogen ions to uh, the drop that pH that's too high. Okay. And, um, the hydrogen ions that are produced can be produced by the teeny, kidneys to decrease the blood pH also, so they can contribute those in there. And other systems that can donate hydrogen ions to uh, lower that pH are going to be the phosphate buffer system, the hemoglobin buffer system, and the protein buffer system. And then um, if you have a gain of too much bicarb, the pH is going to increase here also. Um, and the renal compensation is using, again, sodium bicarb. But what we're going to try to do here is dump this excess bicarb by the kidneys to, uh, decre to decrease that blood pH that's too high. Okay, so your next question. So if your patient has a very high glucose, positive ketones, a low pH, and a low bicarb on the ABG, what acid-base imbalance do you think this is? So it's likely going to be one of the ones we just looked at. So just which one do you think it is? So pay attention to everything that's listed here, and you should be able to pick out the right one. And if you're on Nearpod, then tell me how will the, body's, the patient's body compensate for metabolic acidosis? And then next, uh, how can the hospital staff help this patient? So there are interventions that we can do. Uh, so think about the compensation and what is needed and enter something in there for if you're on Neopod. Okay, so the next uh, one is respiratory acidosis. So you are actually going to see this one pretty commonly. Honestly, metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis are quite commonly seen in your ER and ICU patients. Um, respiratory acidosis is due to alveolar hypoventilation. So uh, there's a problem in that gas exchange where you have an excess PCO2 in the blood. So the CO2 is not able to leave uh, the way it's supposed to and be exhaled through the lungs. So uh, the carbon dioxide removal by the lungs is slower than the carbon uh, dioxide buildup into tissues. So you make it more than what you can get rid of, and therefore you're going to have an excess of PCO2. In acute respiratory acidosis, um, a lot of times it causes a respiratory center that is depressed by the ingestion of drugs. A lot of the painkillers and opiates will do that, especially if you take too many of them, and especially if they're chased with alcohol. And um, that depresses the breathing rate. And so basically they're accumulating CO2 because they're barely breathing. Um, trauma to the central nervous system, so a blow to the head, can also depress that breathing rate, or an infection can do that. Uh, these are 
all causes of acute respiratory acidosis or conditions such as asthma or other airway obstruction. Somebody got strangled, somebody um, swallowed something and it, and it ended up in their lungs. So it actually didn't swallow it. They inhale something into their lungs and there's an airway obstruction. Um, so this is these are all things that acutely interfere with this um, ex, the, the exchange of gases. Chronic respiratory acidosis is caused by comatose states uh, by a depressed system that is ongoing. Um, and the other, the biggest one is you're going to see is COPD. Um, and that's organ involvement. Uh, COPD, uh, in COPD, you have damage to the lungs or you have chronic obstruction by mucus. Uh, and so the your lungs aren't working right, and that's why the because of the damage to the lungs, the lungs are simply not able to get rid of the CO2 at the rate that it's being produced, like from there on out, as long as that patient lives. So how does the body deal with respiratory acidosis? Um, so because the problems involve the lungs, they cannot compensate via the lungs, so they're going to compensate uh, via metabolic reactions. And so the buffer systems are initially going to crank up the bicarb levels. Um, and But at first, only slightly. Um, people that have chronic COPD are going to have like bicarb levels that are double that of normal patients. And um, so that's, that's a, a good first, you know, um, first line of action for the body to do. Renal compensation can happen, but it often takes days. But what they're going to do, is the kidneys are going to try to increase the excretion of carbonic acid, increase the reabsorption of the bicarbonate, because we need to keep it, and increase the sodium reabsorption exchange for hydrogen ions. Um, and so it's going to dump hydrogen ions and put sodium back into blood. The respiratory compensation is simply not possible in all patients because there is an issue with the lungs. The lab findings. So in an acute respiratory acidosis, you will have a high CO2 um, with uh, levels greater than 45 and a low pH. So you see the levels are moving in opposite direction. High CO2, low pH. In chronic cases, the CO2 is elevated, but the pH could be normal or slightly abnormal. And the reason it is is because their bicarb is greatly elevated. The body's just compensated by just always putting more bicarb into the system to compensate for that excess acidity from the retained CO2. So uh, the mechanisms for respiratory acidosis. So... Um, if you have a, you know, first a normal acid-base balance everywhere else, and then you have hypoventilation that causes an increased CO2. So this hypoventilation could be because of, again, yeah, because of drugs or because of damage to the lungs, uh, their lungs aren't working. So uh, obviously the chemoreceptors are going to be stimulated in response to that respiratory acidosis. And either the buffer systems, um, other than the carbon, carbonic acid um, bicarb system are going to start picking up excess hydrogen ions. And um, again, in the kidneys, it's going to try to uh, secrete those excess hydrogen ions and um, keep, make more bicarb and put it back into the blood. So if you can have respiratory compensation, then what needs to happen is the respiratory rate needs to be increased to decrease that CO2. But again, this often is not possible. This is an avenue of intervention for uh, the medical staff. Obviously, what they can do is go in and intubate the patient and start breathing for them to increase their respiratory rate in a mechanical kind of way. Um, there are also machines like uh, uh, BiPAPs that can um, push air into the lungs, basically, is what they do without uh, the patient being intubated, and that can restore the normal acid-base balance. And um, respiratory alkalosis, this is the last one. Uh, it's usually to, due to alveolar hyperventilation, so it's a respiratory system issue and there's it's breathing too much and it causes a deficit of co2 and so it leads to a decreased partial pressure of your arterial carbon dioxide 
the decrease in CO2 increases then the ratio of bicarb to PCO2, which increases the pH level, because basically you've lost too much of your acid, therefore you have too much of your base, which means that your pH level will go up. There are a variety of causes to respiratory alkalosis, but anxiety, panic attacks, and excessive crying are one of them, with the hyperventilation being uh, emotional or having another cause. And like I said, PTSD could cause this. Uh, some drugs can cause this. Um, septicemia can cause respiratory alkalosis and hyperventilations. Uh, cerebral vascular accidents and strokes. Um, and it's also a common finding in patients that are on mechanical ventilators if they're being ventilated too much. So that's usually a cue for your respiratory therapist to maybe turn down the rate of ventilation a little bit because they're breathing too much. So the um, compensation mechanism are going to be opposite of that of respiratory acidosis. So the cellular bu buffer systems are going to release more hydrogen ions to lower the pH, and the kidney is going to try to uh, excrete more bicarb to lower that pH. The lab findings are going to be a decreased CO2 and an increased pH, usually with a normal bicarb. So again, they're moving in opposite directions. pH is going up because we're having alkalosis. CO2 is going down. All right, uh, so the mechanism for respiratory alkalosis uh, with a normal acid-base balance or everything else being equal, there's hyperventilation, maybe a panic attack that messes with the chemoreceptors, which detects respiratory alkalosis. The buffer systems other than a carbonic acid uh, bicarb system are going to release hydrogen ions into the system to um, lower that pH and uh, renal compensation, the um, um, hydrogen ions are going to be generated and put back into the blood to um, lower that pH and the excess bicarb here can be secreted. Um, if you can get uh, respiratory rate compensation, you can have a uh, it would decrease the respiratory rate. So sometimes it's just talking to somebody, having to control breathing. Um, also breathing in a paper bag can allow them to rebreathe their CO2 and it can increase the CO2 and then return to a normal acid-base balance. So if you recap everything that we've talked about, if your pH is low, um, you're in acidemia or acidosis. If your pH is high, you're in alkalemia or alkalosis. If it's normal, uh, it, there's either no abnormality or it could be a mixed acid-based disorder, and we're not going to get into detail, but basically just think of all the conditions that we've talked about, and if multiple of those were happening in a patient, then things could be moving on all kinds of different directions. But let's keep things simple. So um, if you have a low pH, have an acidemia. If it's respiratory, your CO2 is going to be high. If it's metabolic, your bicarb is going to be low. If it's respiratory with your high CO2, it's going to be compensate, compensated in the kidneys. So it's renal, bicarb, retention, and hydrogen ion elimination. And the bicarb, um, in this case, um, may lower and be less than 24 uh, as it's compensating. So uh, again, if you have your low pH and it's metabolic acidosis, your bicarb is going to be too low and you're going to do... Um, you're going to eliminate, because there's excess acids, you're going to eliminate those acids as much as you can through breathing CO2 out, uh, hyperventilating, and um, that will drop your CO2 uh, because that's what you're trying to do to get rid of um, excess acids. If you're in alkalemia, so your pH is high, if it's respiratory in cause, your CO2 is going to be less than 38, and the compensation is going to be renal by eliminating bicarb and then retaining hydrogen ions. If you're in alkalemia and it's of metabolic origin, that means your bicarb is too high, and you're going to compensate uh, by... Uh, using CO2 retention, so by hypoventilating or, or severely decreasing the rate of breathing to increase the CO2. And that is your recap. So I have a few questions for you to ponder. So if your patient has advanced lung cancer, the CO2, PCO2 is high, 
do PO2 and pH are low, what kind of acid-base imbalance do you think you would have? If you're not sure, go back through the video and try to figure it out. Then tell me how will the body try to compensate in that case. And then tell me what the hospital staff can do to help this patient. And again, this is another, um, again, the way, this is more like the graph of how you interpret your ABG. So you, you draw an arterial blood. If your pH is less than 7.40, you're in acidosis. If your pH is greater than 7.40, you're in alkalosis, or it should be really 3.5 and 4.5. But if then you look at your bicarb parameter, and if it is low, you're in metabolic acidosis. If it's normal, but then you look at your CO2 and your CO2 is high, then you're in respiratory acidosis. Um, and if you're in metabolic acidosis, a lot of times your CO2 is going to be also a little bit low uh, or normal. Uh, and it, you, if, so if you, your pH was low, so you're in acidosis, the pCO2 is high, so you're in respiratory acidosis, uh, the bicarb then can often be elevated due to renal compensation. Then if you take your arterial blood sample, and your pH is high, 7.40, you have alkalosis. If you look at your bicarb, you see that the bicarb is high, then it's a metabolic alkalosis, and your pH usually, uh, sorry, your pCO2 is usually going to go up to try to compensate via respiratory system. If uh, your pCO2 is less than 40, so you your pH is high, your CO2 is low, then it's a respiratory alkalosis, and likely you'll see your bicarb is going to be less than 24 or normal because of the renal compensation that's going on. And there's you have a matching in your last question, and that wraps up our acid-base balance lesson. Thank you.